My name is Max Feinstein and I'm an anesthesiology resident at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. Anesthesiologists routinely render patients completely paralyzed under general anesthesia for many different types of surgeries. In this video, I explain why we do that and how we safely reverse paralysis once surgery is done and it's time to emerge the patient from anesthesia. And I'm also going to be electrocuting myself in this video for educational purposes. If you find this video interesting or helpful, I'd really appreciate it if you liked it and subscribe to the channel. Let's dive in. Just a friendly reminder that this is a YouTube video. It's not medical advice. If you need medical advice, talk to your doctor. Before we get too far, I want to emphasize that when anesthesiologists administer paralyzing medications, it is only when a patient is under general anesthesia and not aware of anything that's going on. There can actually be a number of reasons why we might paralyze a patient during surgery, and some of those actually have to do with anesthesia. Depending on whether we need to intubate a patient for surgery, meaning placing a breathing device that goes through the vocal cords, we actually find it very helpful to have a patient paralyzed, at least for a short period of time, while that endotracheal tube is being placed through the vocal cords. If a patient is not paralyzed, then the vocal cords can actually be closed, making it impossible or at least dangerous to try to place a breathing tube through the vocal cords. Once the breathing tube is passed through the vocal cords, there's not a need to keep the patient paralyzed because the tube keeps the vocal cords open. For that reason, if the surgery doesn't require paralysis, then we'll tend to use a very short-acting paralytic agent called succinylcholine that lasts for maybe five to six minutes, which gives us enough time to intubate the patient, but then doesn't leave the patient paralyzed any longer than they need to be. There are many surgical reasons why a patient might need to be paralyzed in the middle of surgery. For example, if you're a surgeon who's performing a hernia repair and you're operating on a patient's abdominal muscles, but those muscles are moving as the patient is initiating their own breathing, then it's like trying to suture on a moving target. At least, that's what I'm told. I'm not a surgeon. I, I don't know. In addition to facilitating a motionless surgical field, there are safety-related reasons why a patient might need to be paralyzed during surgery. For example, during robotic surgery, there's a very large robotic instrument that is placed over the patient, and if the patient were to have any spontaneous movement, even though they're not awake, of course, that movement could cause the patient to bump into the robot in a way that would be dangerous. So it's especially important to keep patients paralyzed during robotic surgery. There are a number of different longer-acting paralyzing medications, and the ones that I commonly administer include rocuronium and, to a lesser extent, vecuronium and cisatricurium. The decision about what agent to use can be based on factors like whether the patient has any sort of kidney disease, which can impair the metabolism of agents like rocuronium. For example, in kidney transplant surgeries where a patient doesn't have a functioning kidney, I actually use cisatricurium because it doesn't rely on the kidney to be metabolized. When we are administering paralyzing medications, it's critical that we monitor just how paralyzed the patient is. It's actually not just a binary on-off switch, paralyzed or not paralyzed, but really a continuum of muscle weakness ranging from a little bit weak to completely paralyzed with everything in between. It's critical to make sure once we emerge a patient from anesthesia that the paralysis has basically been completely reversed so the patient can breathe on their own without any issues. Inadequate reversal of paralysis has been shown to be associated with a number of post-operative issues like aspiration, the need for reintubation, decreased patient satisfaction, and longer stays in the post-anesthesia care unit, or PACU. One of the traditional ways of monitoring the depth of paralysis is to attach a device called a nerve stimulator to a very specific area on a patient's arm that stimulates a nerve that moves muscles in the hand. The way we use the monitor is to deliver four shocks consecutively to the patient and see whether or not there's any movement of the patient's hand. This is called train of four, or TOF, as shown on this nerve stimulator. Based on the patient's reaction to the electrical stimulation, we can determine just how much reversal medication we need to give in order to reverse the paralysis. One of the significant drawbacks of using this train of four monitoring that requires us to either see or feel the patient's response to the nerve stimulation 
is that we need to have the patient's arm accessible if that is where we're monitoring the nerve stimulation. There are other areas of the body that we can monitor nerve stimulation, like the face or on the ankle, but one of the most reliable areas tends to be on the forearm right here. If the surgeon has to have the patient's arm tucked by their side during surgery, then it becomes impossible for us to use the arm to measure nerve stimulation. Another significant drawback of this traditional type of train of four nerve stimulation is that we are subjectively determining what the patient's response is to the electrical shocks that are delivered. Here's a brief example of what it looks like to turn up the dial to, I don't know, let's go with a little bit less than halfway and deliver a shock and see if you can detect any movement in my hand. So as you can see, it's actually pretty challenging to visually assess how many twitches my hand has in response to electrical stimulation. Fortunately, there are different types of devices that actually automate the process of determining how much the patient responds to electrical stimulation, and this is called quantitative train of four monitoring. This particular device that I have accessible to me has a couple of pads where the patient is stimulated, and then several pads to detect the amount of movement that the patient has in response to stimulation. Once the electrode array is connected, we don't actually have to have the patient's hand in view. It can be completely tucked underneath the surgical field, and the device will pick up the patient's response to electrical stimulation. I'm going to start with a pretty low setting to just ease my way into shocking myself with this one. So when I go ahead and press the play button, four shocks are delivered, and you can actually very clearly see my hand movement in response to those shocks. But more importantly, the device picks up what my response was and tells me on a screen so that it eliminates the subjective measuring that I have to do with my eye. In fact, quantitative train of four measuring is so much better than the qualitative train of four measuring that it was featured in this month's Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation newsletter as there are now updated guidelines recommending the use of quantitative train of four monitoring. The Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation, or APSF, is a nonprofit organization that's played a critical role in some of the most important patient safety developments in anesthesiology. And they're a great source of information for patients and healthcare providers alike. If you'd like to read more detail about updated guidelines regarding the use of neuromuscular blockade monitoring, check out the June 2023 APSF newsletter, which I've linked below. If succinylcholine has been used to paralyze a patient, there's actually no need to administer any reversal medication because the succinylcholine is metabolized in a short period of time. However, if a longer acting agent like rocuronium or vecuronium is used, then a reversal agent typically is indicated, assuming that the patient does have some residual paralysis. A classic reversal agent called neostigmine has been used for years. However, it does have some side effects and takes a little bit of time in order to be completely effective. It's also worth pointing out that neostigmine technically doesn't reverse paralysis, but rather competes against the paralyzing agent to make the patient strong again. A more recent pharmacologic development is a medication called Sugamidex, which does actually reverse some of the paralyzing agents like rocuronium and vecuronium that are commonly used. Sugamidex has fewer side effects than neostigmine and is extremely reliable. And for those reasons was also included in the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation's newsletter on updated guidelines for the reversal of paralytic agents. If you enjoyed this video, you might want to check out this video where I discuss the special considerations for using paralytics in patients who have a neuromuscular condition called myasthenia gravis. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time.